Okay, well, <laughs> you guys are seeing this video for the first time. I've actually been trying to do this video for a minute. Keep getting phone calls, all kinds of weird stuff, getting butt dialed by people. Man. Anyway, let me try this again and see if I can get this video out. Evidently, Satan doesn't want this video out. So, the, the Messianic Jews have a very unique perspective on Jesus. And on, because they come from the Old Covenant and the way things were done before, that's their life. That's what the, how they're raised. Then when they come into the New Covenant, they bring that with them. And there's a greater understanding of what those things mean. We have to do study on that because we're Gentiles. And learn about these things and how they apply. They already came from that life. The, the way things were supposed to go was God got them set up. Got them in all these things. Then bring Jesus in. And then the meaning, the true meaning of these things would manifest well a lot of your jews are orthodox and they've stuck to the old way uh you know overlooking a lot of things but those who come over to believe in jesus christ as, and realize that he was the messiah they bring a very unique perspective to their newfound faith because they bring a lot of the old stuff there because it manifests to its true form uh, and it, a lot of it is shadows of but was shadows of things that were going to happen now. And even now we see shadows of things that are coming. Um, Yom Kippur is part of this. Uh, this whole thing started off as uh, I was going to do a video about the, the red sash and how it turned white. And it led me to this article. It's a very good article because uh, Messianic Jews have such a unique perspective than what we have. And we've grown up, up around our perspective. But looking into theirs and listening to theirs is, is really opens things up and helps understanding. They're God's people. They're always going to be God's people. So everything started with them and was given to them and then came to us. A lot of people are trying to replace us, the, the church with, or replace the Jews with the church, not realizing it's because of the Jews we have what we have. You should be giving thanks for them. You should be praying for them. Okay, so let's see if we can get through this without another interruption. So, I want to read this article. It's Yom Kippur Reflection 2017 by Dr. Michael Hertz. And listen to what he says here, because he talks about the red sash and things like that and where that comes from. And a lot of new terminology, terminology we have now, comes from this. Um, but the perspective that he has on this is very unique and it's worth mentioning. Um, and this ties into the red sash and when it stopped turning white. And it was a very unique situation that a lot of people are just now starting to make the connection. We are now celebrating the final fall feast, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a joyous conclusion to some of the more sobering and serious thoughts Jewish people have considered during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is coming up. Rosh Hashanah is coming up too. May I share some of my reflections about Yom Kippur? The mood of sobriety and seriousness is still in the air for us as Jewish people. Now remember, this is his perspective from 2017. So enjoy the peace, and your comments are appreciated. A special Yom Kippur. There was one Yom Kippur service that stands out in my memory. It was the Yom Kippur 1973. I was nine years old, sitting in the crowded shul. Suddenly, one man ran up to the bima, the bima seat, so pay attention because you're going to see a lot of things that are going to jump out at you. Ran up to the bima when the rabbi was at the pulpit. Who's our new rabbi? They whispered back and forth and the rabbi's face grew more somber. Then the rabbi made an announcement to the congregation. On this day, the holiest day of the year, the day when all of Israel was fasting and praying to the Almighty, Israel was attacked. On the day when Israeli troops were pared down to a skeleton force, on the day when public transportation would be shut down, on the day when the radios were silent. Humanly speaking, Israel should not have survived such an onslaught. They should not have survived any other wars they faced either. Israel's very existence is a modern day miracle, and it is. No people group in their history of the world has ever been in dysphoria for 1900 years then returned to their homeland speaking their original language. And I covered this in a video months ago. And the, 
throughout history, as far back as we can look, the Jewish people, the, the Israelites, are the only people to ever be in that situation that long and come back to their original state with their original language. It's stunning. Most, you know, five, six hundred years, you can't find them anymore. They've been bred out. Not the Jewish people. They've held on all this time. It's a, they're blessed by God. The current crisis of Israel and the Jewish people. But there is another crisis Israel and the Jewish people are facing. This one is not of a military threat, but is, it is of a spiritual nature. Actually, this is a crisis that Jewish and Gentile people have been facing for centuries. This is a crisis that Yom Kippur speaks to in an amazing way. This is the whole concept of the holiness of God and finding atonement. Holiness, it permeates this season. It permeates our liturgy. It permeates our thoughts. The Hebrew word for holy is kadosh. The word kadosh appears throughout the book of Leviticus at least 87 times. That is what the holiday is about. Kadosh Elohim, the holiness of God, and the path to his presence. In fact, of all the holy days, Yom Kippur is the holiest. It is literally considered a matter of life and death. Now, when I'm done with this article, I'm going to show you something. The main chapter that speaks of Yom Kippur is the Hebrew scripture, in the Hebrew scriptures, is Leviticus 16. In Leviticus 16, 1 through 2, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Remember the setting. We have the children of Israel in the wilderness, the tabernacle and the gorgeous tent where the very presence of God dwelt. The Holy of Holies. There's a lot of videos going up today. The Holy of Holies above the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. We have a reminder of death, the consequences of sin, the consequences of doing things our way instead of living in obedience to a holy God. But it wasn't just any death. It was the death of Aaron's sons, the high priest's own sons. What a reminder that anyone can sin, even those who seem most spiritual or religious among us. And for that sin, we all deserve death. The wages of sin is death. But Aaron was to approach God, and in doing so, he shouldn't come empty-handed. You see, even the Kohen Hagodal, the high priest, did not have enough righteousness of his own to approach God. The one who was supposed to be the mediator between God and man also was sinful. No matter how good we are, we are not good enough for the perfect holiness of God. In fact, when Isaiah was confronted with the holiness of God, he responded with, Woe is me. That's in Isaiah 6 5. Immediately compared to God, the lack of holiness of his holy of this holy man became apparent. There was nothing Isaiah could do in and of himself to become holy. He needed the cleansing from God. Don't we all? In Isaiah 64, 6, it says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Our sinful, sinfulness separates us from God. Imagine if someone gave you a nice, clean glass of cold, ice-cold water. Would you drink it? Of course. Now imagine... If before you took your first sip, they told you there was just a little bit of schmutz mixed in the water. I'll let you guys look up what that word is, what it means. Maybe so little you would barely notice. Would you drink it then? Of course not. You see, God is holy, and we are not. God is like the purest drinking water you can imagine. Actually, he's a thousand times purer than that. We are like the glass with the schmutz. We have all sinned, and that sin has separated us from God. In our sinful state, we cannot fellowship with God. We cannot drink from our cup. But you're probably saying, I'd never murder anyone. Well, that's great, but have you ever disobeyed your parents? Did you ever covet, ever desire something that never belonged to you? If so, that is called sin. You are guilty. So am I. Something has to happen to make our glass clean. Payment must be made in order to be in the presence of a perfect, perfectly holy God. In Scripture, blood is a sort of heavenly currency. 
a payment, so to speak. It is vicarious atonement, a life for a life. This is the theme seen throughout Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Covenant as well. In the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Hebrew Scriptures, God says He will allow the blood of innocent animals to be exchanged for the lives of the people. Their clean glass of water can be substituted for our schmutz-laden glass. God is allowing blood on the altar to make atonement for the soul. But how? How can we become that clear glass of water? How can atonement be accomplished? Leviticus 16 offers specific instructions. The passage makes it very clear that only the only answer is vicarious atonement, a life for a life. But whose life? God allowed the life of sinless animals to be substituted in our place. Their cup of clean water would be substituted for our schmutz-laden cup. On Yom Kippur, God said he would accept their shed blood as a substitute for ours. Leviticus 17.11 brings this point home. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. So how can one be sure to get the desired response? With no altar, no temple, no sacrifice, how is it possible to atone for our sins on this day of atonement? Clues can be found in looking at the two goats that were to be sacrificed on Yom Kippur. The sin offering for the entire nation consisted of two male goats. Now think of this scene. Picture the tabernacle and pictures the altar, picture the altar, where the sacrifices were made. Outside of this altar are two or three million Jewish worshipers all facing the altar. Between the people and the altar are two goats. It's an incredible sight if you think about it. The two goats stood with their backs to the people. They were facing the sanctuary. Both of these goats had the same size and appearance. They cost exactly the same and they appeared to be identical. This was no coincidence. In an urn nearby were two tablets which were also identical except for the inscriptions that were on the tablets. One of the tablets had the Hebrew letters Yod, He, Vav, He. This is where we get Yahweh from. The only name of God. The holy name of God. I know. It's time for my injection today. Sorry, guys. The holy name of God. The other one said Azazel. That is a very difficult word to interpret. The word for goat in Hebrew is Ez. The Arabic term az Azela means to remove, and the Hebrew term Azel means to turn away or reject. So, the best we can come up with is this, the get out of here goat. This is what the Azazel was. That's where this, this exact thing right here is where we get the term scapegoat. You can look that one up. So, what is this twofold function of the two goats? Here it is. The lots are drawn. Now look at the shadows here. The one that says Adonai is applied to the first goat. This goat is slaughtered. Its blood is sprinkled in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Leviticus 16.16 16 says, Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions for all their sins. In other words, it was a sin offering for the whole nation. All eyes are on the second goat. The high priest goes up to this animal and lays his hands on it. In Leviticus 16, 20-22, it says, When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities, to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Leviticus says the animal took on his own body the sin of the people. Not speaking metaphorically, not speaking symbolically, the animal embodied sin. You guys seeing where this story is going? It became the sin of Israel. Then the second goat, the Azazel goat, the get out of here goat or scapegoat, becomes a despised object. Despised and rejected, this goat was to be removed from the camp as quickly as possible. If you think about it, it is ironic that the very thing that is to carry away the sin of Israel should be so despised and rejected. Who else did that happen to? In temple times, the Talmud records that a scarlet sash was tied to the horns of the goat. 
he is led to the high precipice, where the sash is cut. A piece of this scarlet sash is then tacked to the precipice. Next, the goat was pushed off the cliff. As the life passed out of the sin-bearing goat, which had become sin for Israel, the scarlet sash supernaturally turned white, as though God were saying, Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And that's in Isaiah 118. This miracle occurred every year as though God were confirming the viability of the Yom Kippur sacrifice. He was saying, one more year, I have pushed away the judgment and accepted the sacrifice. Final Atonement But the Talmud, the rabbinic commentary on the Hebrew scriptures, also records a turn of events which shocked and terrified the people of Israel. According to the Babylonian tractate, Yoma 39b, speaking of the last years when the second temple stood, something odd was happening in those parts of the world. Forty years before the destruction of the sanctuary, the lot did not come up in the right hand, and the thread of crimson never turned white, and the westernmost light on the menorah never shone, and the doors of the courtyard would open by themselves. I added that last part because it was in it. I read it in a different article, but that's what would happen. The westernmost light of the menorah would not ignite. Something is going on. The scarlet sash that would constantly turn white when the sin-bearing goat dies suddenly stopped turning white. The doors of the temple would swing open as if to say, you are all welcome now. Come into my presence. You remember what happened when Jesus died? That veil between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple that thing was about 18 inches thick of heavy material, and it ripped from top to bottom. This was the pathway from God to man. What happened? Let us do some math. What happened 40 years before the destruction of the temple? The death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, the perfect sacrifice. The scarlet sash had stopped turning white because this imperfect atonement was made perfect by the sacrifice of a perfect Messiah. See, guys, this is information that generally has not been given to the world. This kind of stuff has been subdued. It's been hidden back. Only people like me and, and just a handful of others have come out and, and shared this information with people, letting them know this is another piece of evidence that Jesus was the Messiah and did live this earth. Because when they were doing this stuff with the temple, that's how things were done. Every year, this is what they did, and that sash turned white. There's several books. Maccabees talks about it. Enoch talks about it. Many books talk about this happening. Now, and, and they, there's other documents too. You can go back and look at, there's all kinds of documents that record this event. That sash would turn white. People would literally see it turn white. When Jesus died and was resurrected, Yom Kippur was just after that. It never turned white again after that. They were, constant, they were having to tie the doors of the temple shut. And then they would still come back and they'd be open. Sometimes they would open right in front of them. God was sending a message. He was talking to his people. This is information that isn't given out. But this reinforces what we already know, that Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice. He became the atonement for sin. He became sin. So we could go and stand before the Father with his righteousness imputed onto us. Not because of us, not because of our works, not because of what we do, all because of him. It is just coincidence, is it just coincidence that this Messiah willingly sacrificed himself 40 years before the destruction of the temple? Is it just a coincidence that the scriptures say of the Messiah that he too was despised and rejected, that we hid our faces from him? Surely he has borne our grief, the Lord says, and carried our sorrows as the scapegoat. Isaiah 53, 3-6. Isaiah 53 is a chapter that is not commonly read to Orthodox Jews. It has been removed from the Torah and the Tanakh. They don't read it. But when you read Isaiah 53 to an Orthodox Jew, they start asking questions. They start getting curious because Isaiah 53 tells them, and I'm going to do a video reading Isaiah 53 after this. Isaiah 53 tells them who their Messiah was and that he has arrived. And many of them get converted because of that. This is why it has been removed. It's all about control, guys. I, I did a video yesterday about that, where I read where they literally, in the Bible, they were like, well, this guy's going to mess up what we got. we got to do something about him. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. And the Berit 
Kadashe, or sorry, Kadasha, i.e. New Covenant, that's in Jeremiah 31, 31, confirms that God made him, Messiah, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, exactly as we saw in Leviticus, of the scapegoat. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. At Yom Kippur each year, we know that God requires, we know what God requires. He requires a mediator and an offering. We have seen it in scripture. He demands blood. I've got a question for you, and it is an obvious one. First of all, who is going to be your mediator? Are you going to mediate? Is your blood so innocent? Nobody can mediate for himself. No one can provide redemption for himself. God has already provided both a mediator and an offering in the King Messiah Yeshua, the hope of Israel and the light to the Gentiles. And if he is your Kippurah covering, you have passed over life's greatest crisis. During Yom Kippur, I fast and pray, not for my own salvation, for it is assured in Messiah Yeshua. I fast and pray for the salvation of my people, that they may also have the same assurance of salvation, and that they may know the one who took our sin on himself to give us access to God the Father. Jesus the Messiah, the mediator between God and man. I will link this in the description so you guys can get to it. Um, you can reference it if you're talking to a Jewish person that isn't saved. You can share it with someone. If your Jewish friends that are saved, share it with them. Uh, they'll be very. This will be very relatable to them. And share this with your Gentile friends, your Christians, so they can see. Sorry, that last part hit me a little bit. Um, share it with them so they can get a better perspective on what this means. The meaning. We take it so trivially, but the meaning behind what Jesus did is so powerful, and it's earth-shattering. It's, it's not a common thing. And we have people that are making the blood of Christ common in the world by denying the very scriptures they say they follow, by denying the very God they say they believe in. And how do they do that? How do they do that? They deny the scriptures that say that Jesus is going to rescue us from what's coming. They deny the scriptures that say he is all powerful. He did it all on the cross and there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. It is all about him. They do that by, they do that by adding works, by adding obeyance of the 10 commandments, obeyance of the law. Now I'm not discounting the law or the 10 commandments. God's law and commandments are perfect. But that does not save you. And this is the misunderstanding they have. Well, I have to follow the Ten Commandments to be saved. No, you don't. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. What does it say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We follow these things and pattern our life according to these things because we love and care for him. Because we respect what he did for us. And we are showing our appreciation for it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, if you want to be saved, you've got to follow these. Nowhere. What does the Bible actually say? You want to be saved? Follow my son. Believe in him. And you don't do that by living the Ten Commandments. You do that by faith. It's all over the Bible. I can give you a link to 100 scriptures right off the bat that show, show its grace through faith. This gift that we have been given, this salvation, is a free gift from God through Jesus to us. How do we accept it? We believe Jesus is everything the Bible says he is. And we reach out and grab a hold of him. And when the day of redemption comes, we pass through him to the Father. And we are all together as one. It's all over the scriptures, but you've got to actually read them in order to see this, in order to understand this. People don't want to do that. Christians are lazy. The church is dead. The way we used to be, we used to stand up for what was right, and now we don't. We used to stand up against things that were evil. Now we don't. Now they're out there blessing them. Blessing and, and uh, anointing the very thing we have been instructed to not have anything to do with. 
the very thing that the Bible, I mean, specifically, the Bible says will be destroyed in the end times. Yet churches are going out there and they're blessing and anointing those things. They're letting them, those very things, those very evil things into their own houses of worship. How can you think God's going to be okay with that? That's not faith. That's treading out the blood of Christ. And the Bible is very clear and says exactly what's going to happen to people that do that. So how do you get saved? Well, this article should have been a pretty convincing factor. Faith in Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Trust in him. Know that he will save you. You won't save you. He will do it. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes when understanding hits the heart. When it, it makes when you know and understand how all this works, that's when the indwelling happens. Acts 10 and Acts 10, 11. Read those two chapters. I did a video on it. Go on, get out of here. It, um... I'm so sorry for that, guys, when those things, those notifications pop up. I have not figured out how to turn them off yet. Um... Train of thought back here. It is, it is all about Jesus Christ. It, everything he did. That's where our salvation comes from. Not about what we do. Not about what we say. Not about how we think. Not about how we live. None of that makes a difference. I shared scripture in here that talks about that. Our, what we do is rags. It's worthless. It is what Jesus already did on the cross. That's how you become saved. Oh, I, was, I, I remember now. Acts 10 and Acts 11. Two different instances. But that, that they were linked because they went from one to the other. Where they were talking to a room full of people. Pharisees, converted Jews, and Gentiles. And while they're giving the testimony, telling them about Jesus, the Gentiles believed. And the Holy Spirit, just like that, jumped on them. And the Jews in the room were like, whoa, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit went to the Gentiles? Like, we haven't even been baptized yet. What happened? They believed. So the Holy Spirit indwelled them. The Jews seek a sign. They needed to do something because that's how they were raised. That's what the law is. So to them, they, in order to get across that threshold, they believed up to a point. But then they needed to do the baptism because to them and their perspective, that was the step into the threshold. When they did that, the Holy Spirit indwelled them. It's according to their faith. People even nowadays, they believe, but they don't go full circle. Always learning, but never coming to the full understanding of the truth until they get baptized. Because they believe that's part of it. And then when they do, they get the Holy Spirit. That's what is needed to get them across the threshold. After that happens, then you understand that those things aren't required for salvation. Now, a whole lot of us have been called up here lately to share this kind of stuff. To show people these things. To share these truths. A lot of people have come to new understandings. And are walking a more closer relationship with the Lord now. Because they got away from legalism. Legalism is, is doing something for your salvation. You don't need to do anything. The only thing you must do for your salvation is the works of God. What is the works of God? That you should believe in the one he sent, Jesus Christ. It's in the Bible. So I'm going to link this in the description. Go check it out. Share it with anybody you want to. Share this video with anybody you want to. The next video I do after this, I'm going to read Isaiah 53. And share it because a lot of people don't get a lot of jews especially don't get don't hear this so we want to put it in a video because it's important it's important to get as much counsel and as much truth out there as possible i'm not a pastor i'm not a teacher i don't have any formal training of any kind i'm just an average person but i can read and understand what i read and that's all that is required to understand the bible is use a little discernment and not trust some, what somebody else says. Trust what the Bible says. I love you guys. I bless you guys in Jesus' name. I bless any of my Jewish brothers and sisters out there that are watching this, that happen to stumble across this. I pray this video blesses you. I pray that 
if you're not already with Jesus Christ, that you go and do the research and realize that he actually was the Messiah. Well, still is. And he's about to return. Israel will be saved, but not, or not till she goes through a lot of issues. So we pray for her. Bless you guys in Jesus' name. I will see you all in the next video. Okay, so uh, the video that I just did, I forgot to add at the end a little tidbit of information I was going to throw in there. Um, it's in relation to Yom Kippur. You guys saw the video that I did about the new comet they discovered, 2019 Q4. Well, I want you to read in the middle paragraph here, currently on an in more inbound trajectory, comet C 2019 Q4 is heading toward the inner solar system. On October 26th, it will pass through the ecliptic plane, the plane in which Earth and the other planets orbit the sun <coughs> from above at roughly a 40 degree angle. Why is this, why am I mentioning this? Well, if you watch that video that I did about the comet, and I said in there a couple of times, I'm not going to tell you what I'm thinking, of what this is. I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, with everything we see going on, in the time of year that it is, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. You know, I'm, I'm not saying this is what it is, but I'm looking at it and it's like, well, that's awful convenient that all of a sudden, out of the middle of, out of nowhere, a ran, random rogue comet comes blasting out of the outer space uh, that we've never seen before. Um, and there's a lot of stuff behind it. It's actually kind of weird how it was discovered and what led up to it. Uh, there's a video, I got did a video on this stuff on YouTube about it. Uh, now I see a ton of videos popping up about it. All kinds of people are getting fire, fired up about this. Um, I'm not saying it's Jesus, but you know what? The, the imagination runs wild. There's an important reason why I'm bringing this up and adding this to the end of this video. This comet is coming in and it's coming out, it's going to be out about as far as Mars is away from us, roughly as it passes through the ecliptic plane, which is the where all the planets spin. It's going to pass through it and go out. Yom Kippur is on October 8th through 9th. The, uh, this video was about Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement. Uh, I don't know, guys. Just pointing out details. Not trying to say, yeah, I'm watching a Tim Henderson video. Not trying to say anything is going to come of this. I'm just... Just like I've done in my other videos, talking about the time of year, the videos, the two videos that I did, part one and two, about the sign of the Son of Man and the actual Pentecost, how it correlates with the different harvests, how they've been calculating this wrong. You know, all these little details all culminate into one conclusion. That this very well could be our year when the rapture happens. I never thought in my lifetime I would ever see this. But I tell you what. It's amazing. It's amazing to see it. You guys do your own research on this. I'm just throwing details out there for you to look at for yourselves. By all means, go and, and check on check that stuff out. But uh, yeah, kind of interesting to see this kind of stuff unfold. Because we know that at the rapture, he's not coming to the earth. He's going to come. There's going to be a cry of command, shout, trumpet. We get changed, the dead rise get changed, we all go meet him in the clouds. You do what you want with that information. Uh, I, I, you can already figure out where I'm going with this. I'm not saying that's what it is, but I'm sure watching this close because this is very, very, this is very interesting to see this. All right, love you guys. Bless you guys in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.